Hi Chris. Hi Pete. Welcome to King Street Studios. Yeah, thanks You've for You've been here before though, haven't you? Yeah, not in here. No, not this in is, this room. No, no. <laughs> but you've been doing stuff in the in the main hall before. Yeah, we've done drumming with the kids and things before, yeah, but in yeah. Capoeira, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's great, great space, love it. That was without Brazil. Yeah, yeah, past, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So neither of us are from Stoke on Trent. No. Um, so where do you hail from? From Derbyshire, so not, not too far away. Okay. Uh, sort of grew up in the Peak District, Whaley Bridge, Peak Forest, sort of gradually sort of moving my way over here, I guess, through sort of mum and dad moving. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of lived in the sort of north tip of Staffordshire for a while, sort of near Longner in the hills, you know, um, then moved to Stoke in 2001. 2001. So... For, for people who don't know you, what, what do you do? What? So yeah, I, I am the founder of Feasted. Mm -hmm. Feasted is, well, we make amazing food, you know? And I'm going to say that, aren't I? You are. I, I am, I, I, I've tasted it a couple of times. Yeah. I yeah. have to agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's very kind. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we make amazing food. Um, the thing that we really focus on is people. You know, that's what the business is all about. Um, whether that's telling stories with food through people's experiences. So we like to, to find out stuff about people and then sort of put that into dishes. Mm -hmm. And I think the, the real thing is there is if that's not done with some skill and understanding of ingredients and sensitivity to the things that we've been told about people, it could be quite tacky, mm -hmm. um, but we do it with like grace and, and uh, you know, hopefully just produce amazing things that people then get to share. And that's how you make your living now? Yeah, pretty much. So I guess that's the front end of the business. Mm -hmm. You know, um, um, the secondary thing from that is because we um, humbly say we're really good at what we do. So we then teach people about that. Mm -hmm. You know, we teach people about, you know, how ingredients work, uh, essentially, you know, how to cook stuff, um, but also how to, how to replicate that, you know? So... I don't see my I don't see feasted as having a competitor competitor, not because we're um, arrogant in any way because that's not that's not what I mean. What I mean is is that you know we're here to feed people amazing food, and give them great experiences of our hospitality, and that's for anyone, Pete. You know, yeah, we do fancy dinner parties if you want to call them that. You know, fine dining, but also community based stuff as well. Um, so we educate people about what we do, and but also how they can do that, how they can be successful. So, you know, we might go into a, a restaurant and help people, help that business mm -hmm. create something amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. I know? I know you're passionate about helping young people, mm. building their self-esteem, etc. And we were talking about how that may have come about in your past. You mm. Tell us that, that story of your youth and your uh, yeah. experience at school. Yeah, so, like, you know, as a young kid, sort of, uh, about age five or six, um, I uh, was sort of beaten by a teacher on several occasions um, because of her frustration about my inability to read, you know, ultimately because I'm dyslexic, you know, whatever that means. Um, so, yeah, you know, that had a significant, profound effect from a very early age, um, debilitating to the point of you know, just feeling like, you know, I guess anything remotely academic, there's another word that I'm not, not so keen on, um, anything remotely academic or would, would be a challenge for me, you know? Um, and then on from that, really, just like a complete sort of disempowerment of my own skills, you know, that are very natural to me. Um, so, yeah, you know, that had such a profound effect from an early age, up, up until probably about... Um, 42, wow. I'm being really honest, you know, I guess, you know, I sort of chiselled away at it over the years, I became yeah, a teacher, yeah, yeah. Yeah. you know, I'd, 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 I'd forged some success for myself, but, but really that was just out of sheer belligerence, you know. So there's a big gap there, isn't there, we, we started at five at this experience, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and we jumped to 42, yeah. so within that, so take it back to leaving school, yeah. what, what, what were you, what was Chris Cohen then at the time you left school, what did yeah. you leave with, what was your ambitions what were your thoughts so education at that stage i had pretty much nothing okay. you know where uh, i left with i just totally disenfranchised at school um and you know if any you know, i'd be honest about that to, to kids that i work with but if they said to me oh well, it's okay for you and you're doing all right so i'm gonna yeah you know, i can follow the same path i'd i'd totally i would ultimately challenge him on that um 
for for lots of different reasons. But yeah, so I left school with um, with nothing, and I uh, went to college to study art because I was pretty good at drawing. And was that locally? Uh, yeah, I ended up at Leake College, mm -hmm. which was, you know, where there was loads of really inspiring people there, mm -hmm. you know, we had, uh, lecture wise at the time. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, I'd, for me, I thought, oh, well, maybe art's my thing. I'm mm -hmm. quite good at it, you know, where I knew I'd really wanted to cook. It's always been there. I've just always loved cooking. Um, but I ended up on this path of doing art, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I eventually went on to study architectural design at uni. Um, to me, Alice, there's a strange um, synergy between building dishes and, and architecture, mm. you know. Um, the two are, they sit very well together in my, in my, in my eyes, you know. Um, so yeah, that was my degree. Um, then I uh, did a few different things then, and then eventually trained to be a teacher. A massive part from when I was a chef, prior to being a teacher, I think it's really important to say that I loved in kitchens, I loved helping people. I loved, because um, I ran kitchens as a head chef, you know, and mm. I, a thing that I really enjoyed was seeing people develop and helping them on that course, investing my time in, in giving them skills, you know, and helping them understand how to grow those skills. So it seemed like quite a natural progression to go into teaching. Um, and, uh, and that was the next stage, really. So, yeah, you know, teaching for a few years. Um, uh, I ex fortunate enough to experience probably f all the way through from from various things I've done, from very sort of you know reception all the way through to sort of post sixteen. So I've taught in some capacity at every age. I'm not for a second suggesting that I'm an expert of every age because I'm not. I'd go as far as to say that I'm not even an expert at any age because of the the way that things change so much mm. but there's certainly certain ages that I, I, I work more comfortable in you know um, so yeah you know edu education um, is something I'm exceedingly passionate passionate about I say education helping people learn mm. and understanding why people uh, what people gain from that and help helping them to understand mm. you know creating a learning environment that's really powerful that will get People, uh, young people or people to sign up to that very thing, that want to, to progress and to improve. Um, if you can make that really clear in the way that you operate as a, you're a facilitator, aren't you, of mm -hmm. education. Uh, if you make that really clear, then people, most people will go, do you know what, I can see the benefit of this. And, that, and that's, that's, that's how I do it. That, that's, the, that's what motivates me. Okay. It, it is about people. Right. You just started a course, you're, you're now working with Stoke and Trent College, um, putting a course together for them. How's that going? Yeah, amazing. I mean, you know, we're first year in and we've done it at a, uh, you could, some might say, a bit of a risky time. You know, hospitality is, well, the wheels have been blown off, so no one knows where it's going to go. You know, we're going to lose restaurants without a doubt, we're, but more will be born out of that, you know. And um, so I think it's, with challenge comes exciting opportunity. And I think it's a really, really positive time to launch something like this because... You know, locally we don't really have much of the upper echelons of, of gastronomy. Um, we make the plates, but we don't put the food on it. Locally mm. as such, there's so much opportunity there. Um, so really the course is all based around raising aspirations in hospitality, mm -hmm. giving young people a sense of opportunity and um, investing in them, not just in terms of giving them a grounding of skill, but higher skill development and creativity and ambition. That's the driver. Um, it's called Feasted. Feasted, uh, level th it's level three. Um, it's the, the highest level course currently at Stoke-on-Trent College and there's talk about maybe developing some more things around that. Um, driven by Steve Heaton at the college. Um, you know, we are working together uh, and some of the things we've done with the kids already, it's been incredible. You know, sort of designing dishes around the local area. There's, if you check out my social media, you'll see one sort of talking about Euturia and you mm. tasted it the other day, I didn't you? It yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was it yesterday day before? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, it's sort of forged out of what we are locally. So this mm. dish came out of just thinking about Euturia and Hanley. A bit of research. Euturia coming from a mm. sort of historical Italian sort of region, um, and Hanley meaning hill meadow. 
if we understand the context around us, you know, a lot of that's historical and cultural, creative, then we can we can do that on a plate, you know, we can create that on a plate, which is don't let anyone ever tell you that it's not it's not creative. Just had a message. <laughs> Some kind of <laughs> yeah. Um so yeah, you know, that that's the thing. It's about it's about if we see see our progression as a straight line currently within hospitality, we there's a few businesses we're gonna end up in. Yeah. You know, uh, if we're more ambitious, because some of these young people at the course, they're at that stage in life where they just naturally feel more ambitious. Those others, might, it might take them an extra 10, 20 years. Mm. That's okay. Mm. Um, those people with that initial ambition, they're going to be driven to go abroad or to one of the big cities. And I get that. But the, the change is we can do that locally mm. if we create that platform. And there's lots of ways we can do that. Mm. So, so moving through that sort of storyline, really, from from you becoming a teacher, um, everybody experiences life changing moments. And we were just talking about about illness as a as a as a way of changing your viewpoint and how. The, mm. And that happened to you at yeah. one point was, during your teaching career. Yeah, you'd so been a teacher for how long? So yeah, that I, I trained in 2012. Right. You know, and I'll be honest, I, I was in the classroom for just a few years. Mm -hmm. But in that few years, I uh, I felt really empowered because uh, of the, I don't know, what, what we achieved or what they achieved, the students achieved, you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I, I became ill um, uh, in 2016 and uh, I sort of left teaching officially in August 2017. Right. So it was kind of, yeah, just a, uh, about 18 months sort of process of sort of realising I was just not going to get well unless I gave myself some time. Right. Um, so it was a funny old sort of transition, really. Paradoxically, at the same time, being ill has given me a great opportunity to develop in ways and understand things that I never thought, uh, you know, get to a point where I never thought I'd get to. You know, so t carrying that sort of low self-esteem from a young age, from being hit by a teacher to just being told I was worthless and me telling myself I was worthless day after day, mm. probably several times a day, several hundred times a day, mm. to then sort of, uh, out of pure belligerence, becoming, you know, doing a degree and becoming a teacher and not accepting that, um, you know, um, I couldn't do stuff. And then becoming ill, which allowed me just to stop, sit, and also get the help I required, I needed. Because mm. let's, I'll be really honest, you know, I was given a lot of drugs and some of those were psychoactive and they really messed my mind up. Some of that stuff was there already. Mm. It brought it to the front and it was like, you deal with this, mm. otherwise it's over, you know? Mm. And I had to deal with it. And I, and I was bloody fortunate enough that I, that I could. Um, I kind of had that voice in the back of my mind that kind of always said, it's gonna be okay. You know, it's almost like that sort of self voice. Mm -hmm. I get there'll be psychological terms for it, but that voice within that just went, you know, this you can do this. Mm. Um, so you know, I had therapy. I uh, invested a lot of time in that. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna mention something now, actually, Pete, because what's what the thing that really changed that and really got me sort of, sort of frames up the last couple of years really mm. is that I was I'd had some intensive therapy. Which had, which really helped with anxiety and um, sort of low excuse me low self esteem. Mm. I don't want Russ is putting that coffee, um, <laughs> <laughs> and but really uh, it was. I'd reached this point where every sort of I don't know three months I'd go back to the therapist and say, "Hey, I'm struggling again," mm -hmm. and I always visualise it like a spiral, and I'd be sort of like working my way up is not up as in success, but up as in sort of reaching out of this sort of feeling of uh, despair and you know feeling lost mm -hmm. and then I, I sort of and I'd, and I'd sort of hit that and sort of like sort of come back down again I'd, I'd reach out and get and get some more help and I realized I was just stuck in this trap of sort of like feeling better feeling better and then and sort of sliding down feeling lost and getting like, mm -hmm. that kind of went on um, and I just thought do you know what I kind of finished with that I, I need to address this in a different way and that's where I reached out to a life coach mm -hmm. 
and it was absolutely the right thing to do okay. because what that did it was it gave me um, it changed the focus so you know the, the therapy is great and what I'd say to anyone is you know if you need therapy bloody well get it don't sit back why sit and suffer mm. go and get it but kind of know yourself enough to think you know if, if I'm repeating this behavior over a longer period of time so that could be that could be 12 months two years whatever mm. the chances are you need to start helping yourself in a different way and that's what I did and and that was incredible mm -hmm. because you know it, it allowed me to really invest more thought in my mm -hmm. in what I was really feeling creatively and you know about me and my wants and needs as a human being not in a selfish way in fact completely opposite of that about how I could move my my vision forward and my you know my personal belief system mm. to really sort of frame that in a much more meaningful way you know um, so that would be my advice to anybody just mm. if you're stuck in that process maybe it's time that you change the focus you know so would you say it's the, the physical illness where you, you, you physically became ill and hospitalized during that time that allow you the space to think through that. I mean, those things would have been with you before that, I would guess. Yeah. What's really weird is that in that period of time, for years and years and years, I'd forgotten that I'd been hit by a teacher. It wasn't until I stopped mm -hmm. and started to just, I don't know, slow down, mm. it came back to me. Mm. And then it all made sense. And I guess... I've, yeah, I refer to it every so often. I bring it up in conversations, but only when, only when I think it's necessary. It's not. Mm. A, it's by no means something that I, I beat myself with because I'm free from that. I don't. I don't do that anymore. But what? But what? It, what it did is being able to sort of have that as a reference point. It mm. just made sense of like all the stuff that had gone on for years. Yeah, yeah. But um, it's funny how we can cover memories up, but we can't cover up necessarily cover up the effects of what those things did to us. Yeah. We forget they happened. Yeah. But the way we react to things, the way we react to life yeah. situations are very much dependent on what happened to us Absolutely. at those times. Yeah, I totally. Think. I think I think you know my wife's a big player in this because over the years she'd say stuff to me like, oh, do you know your moods are up and down and it wasn't mm. from sort of like years of sort of hearing Helly's voice sort of, you know and I guess you'd dismiss that for a while. Oh no, no, no. You know, I'm just tired or whatever, you know. <laughs> but actually, you start to like, you start to process that in a, when I mean, you're in that mindset of like, I want to overcome this challenge, or I want to at least give it a damn good go. Mm. Um, uh, those that voice of you know your partner or someone you're close to it, mm. it can really makes help you make sense of it, I guess. Mm. You know, and I don't think there's people in your life that do stuff, say stuff that's positive, that you'd never, I guess, really, um, it's, it's really powerful stuff, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah very. It's massive. Yeah. So so coming through all that, you'd, <laughs> yeah. you'd had those life experiences, you, your life was getting on, you became a teacher, uh, you then became ill, which knocked you back, allowed you time to think and everything, and that time to think was good, your mm. life coach, all that time mm. that you had to process all this and move forward. So <laughs> at what point did you think, I'm going to start my own business. Yeah, so weirdly... <laughs> possibly the worst thing you could do for your time. It's again that thing, isn't it? Sometimes <laughs> when it appears to be the worst, maybe it's the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'd left teaching in or at the end of August 2017. My business kind of started in October 2017. Okay. I was literally... I mean, I had some thoughts bubbling away for a little while, I guess, but nothing, there was no plan. There was never a plan, you know, um, at least not at that, that, that stage. But but literally, I went onto Facebook one day and just put a post out there. I went, hey, guys, mm -hmm. uh, just wondering, would anyone like any soup and bread? You know? Yeah. And there was something lovely about sort of just putting this really humble thing out, you know, soup, especially bread. It's got so many con connotations of, mm -hmm. you know, it's very therapeutic to make. It's, you know, it's... Um, just something really it just felt right mm -hmm. and I guess for the next sort of six eight months I delivered soup bread and then we did we did casserole and uh, some cakes and some pestos and just various other bits and pieces mm -hmm. and those people who supported me 
and who contributed to that through that six, eight months, they, yeah, okay, financially it was really helpful, mm -hmm. but it wasn't about the money. Like what they gave me, you know, putting their trust in me and, um, you know, sharing their time, like on doorsteps chatting away, what that did for me in, a, in terms of therapy was, and, and, and just, it was just so enabling, you know, and it, it's that thing again, isn't it? People. Mm. You connect with people, mm -hmm. it's really powerful. Doing something honest, whatever that means, um, and it was just, that was therapy in itself. Mm -hmm. Just getting me out of the house, getting cooking, it gave me a purpose, mm -hmm. it was just amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, doing something honest. I think I think it's doing something you love doing. That helped. You're not, you're not, yeah. you're not kidding anybody, you're not pretending to be anything no. else, you're just doing what you love doing. Yeah. I think that's where the honesty comes in, isn't it? Yeah, I guess so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Mm. So moving forward from all this, mm. what's coming up? Right, okay, so whew, yeah, so obviously uh, the, the working with the State Contract College, fired mm. up with that, um, literally in the first first half term. It's really fresh, you know, we've been in and done a couple of dishes with the, the kids, say kids, students, um, and you know, that's been incredible. Um, we're gonna do foraging next week. After half term, we're going to do some fermentation. We're bringing in molecular gastronomy. Uh, it's really just building a really ambitious picture for these students, giving them access to stuff that they wouldn't normally get access to mm -hmm. and enabling the college to do that in a really, really incredible way uh, is what it's all about. Nice. So that's, that's that. I mean, um, I work um, with schools, mm -hmm. also train, help to upskill and train food teachers. Mm -hmm. Um, what else are we doing? We've got the dinner parties and stuff, sort, sort of things bubbling away. We might be doing a big event in, in Liverpool uh, this Christmas. We're sort of just in talks around that. Um, yeah, we're working with Steel Light, you know. Um, it's, it's all good stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all really powerful stuff. Now we're just really sort of building a wider vision as well. We're really talking about, you know, how can we build gastronomy and, and a better food system in Stoke-on-Trent? Mm -hmm. You know, I've talked about sort of and I, I don't really know what the right term is, but fancy food or posh food or frame it how you like, just food that's that's an experience ultimately. Um, but at the same time, that experience with food, if that's just to feed yourself and, and your family, that's equally as important. You know, it, Everyone's relationship with food is different and it's about giving people opportunity to experience food in the most positive way. That's what it's all about. Excellent. And I hear we're gonna be seeing your face around Stoke and Trent quite often coming up. Are we allowed to talk about that? No. no. <laughs> okay. Tell me about the agricultural bill. <laughs> yeah, so the agriculture bill, yeah. So yeah, that's um a real talking point at the minute. Okay. I mean it's been you know, I was sort of reading up more about it the other day and you know it's been in the sort of they've been talking about it for a lot longer than you'd think actually. But you know, our, our food system currently, or should I say our, our food standards are s some of the best in the world, mm -hmm. especially in Europe as well. Um, and, you know, that we should protect that. And we should want to be better. That's what we teach kids in school. Mm. Well, that's what we try to teach kids in school, mm. doesn't it? Shouldn't that apply to, like, the things that we do governmentally as well and, mm -hmm. you know, with society and everything? We're trying to improve progress as humans is really... That's what drives all of us, hopefully, you know, mm -hmm. in some way or the other. So I don't get that when that becomes under threat. Mm -hmm. I understand the reasons why. I can understand the motivations. I say understand. I'm aware of the motivations, which is largely financial. But down the line, it's appreciating how that's going to affect um, the people in, that, in the food system currently. So, you know, farmers, producers, mm -hmm. you know, the people that make the equipment in the UK, the, the people that come and... Um, mechanics that come and mend the equipment the people that make like every little thing that gets fed into those farms that helps them to then you know um take the food off the land and put that in the, through the chain into the supermarket everybody you're talking like some serious amount of jobs mm -hmm. could be threatened mm -hmm. You know, I, I could be bombastic and say it is going to be threatened, but, you know, could be threatened. We don't know how that's going to play out, but it, it does put it under threat. 
Um, and that's the thing, it's the unknown, isn't it? Why at this time, with everything else that's happening, and you know, I'm not particularly paranoid about the pandemic, I'm not, I'm not, I don't sit in a sort of like paranoid frame of mind, uh, and I don't sit in a, it's not happening frame of mind either. I'm just like, let's just be bloody sensible, you know? Mm -hmm. um, with everything that's going on, there might be something to do with the us leaving Europe as well, whatever that was, no one talks about that anymore. <laughs> um, but that might be happening as well. So why should we put, let's just make good decisions. Mm. Let's, let's refer to common sense. Mm. I think that's the key term. Everyone says, oh, it's com common, isn't it? It's common to refer to common sense. Oh, well, mm. everyone has a different sort of view of what common sense is. But I think, does it have a common purpose? Does it have a common value? Will everyone benefit from us remaining uh, at the top of the tree with our food standards? The answer is yes. Mm. The answer is yes. So that is a common, has a common purpose, thus meaning it's common sense. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean, you know? Um, I believe, and I've mentioned it already, I believe that taking this, I'm not, I'm not pulling this stuff out of the air, mm. Pete, you know? Um, a lot of my philosophies around food have come from places, from studying people like Klaus Mayer and René Rizepi and, and what they did in the Nordic region and how they had a manifesto for the food. Mm. You know, at one point, th there wasn't much else in, in the Nordic region other than pickled herring. And, th <laughs> you know, obviously, that's a really sort of generalisation and people will correct me on that, and rightfully so. But you get my point. Mm. Like, now, Nordic cuisine is, mm. is, a, is huge in its own right. It's, you know, it, it has amazing value mm. and also commercial value. You listen to those guys talk about what that did to Copenhagen mm. and the increase in the income and the business and the hotel. Um, you know, we've got a couple of new Hiltons going up around here. Someone needs to go and stay there, don't they? Mm. Why don't we just build like a, mm. a, a, an amazing hospitality sector that drives that, you know? Mm. Food brings people together. People want it, you know? Um, so, so this, you know, these are the places I've pulled it from. But also there's a guy called um, Tim Lang. Whenever I go for a name, I sometimes forget it. And it's always like, oh, what? What's, What's that his name? name? What's his name? <laughs> oh, no. Uh, Tim Lang, right? Professor Tim Lang. I saw him talk at Kiel. I, was, I, was, I, I had a tip off by somebody up at Kiel. You need to come see this guy talk. It was incredible. This guy, uh, it, was, it was February. It was just before the pandemic hit. You know, and he talked about, you know, like literally one like um, sort of um, disaster away from exposing our food system and there you go weeks later it was like wow mm. tim he's on the pulse because he, he knew it was coming <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. and um you know he's a government advisor um uh, i say that loosely because for his own admission they don't listen to him as much as they should um because what he's done is he's written papers and you know he's an academic he's that's that's what he does he's written papers and books about food systems and about where that should be heading you know, let's make no mistake, we're, we're taking over this planet, we're at 7 billion-ish, mm. and you know, we're, when we get to 9 billion, we've got some serious problems, and along the way, you know, that'll, you know, it, you know it's all, the, the evidence is already there. What Tim Lang has, has really defined, and there are others as well, but what he's done is really given us a blueprint, a framework for how that could work successfully, you know? Yeah, it needs investment. Yeah, it needs time. Yeah, it needs um, understanding. Yeah, it needs education. We should be teaching kids about these things in school. Um, and it's all about micro food systems that are relevant to the area that, ex I was going to use the word exploit, but it needs to be more sensitive than that. Mm. Um, sort of, you know, um, different kinds of land are more suited for growing different things. So yep. just understanding that, you know. It makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. It's like kind of working with nature, isn't mm. it? You know? It's, it's that simple and that's the way we should be heading not heading to a, 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 an open market of of influx of food from uh, a place wherever that is I think there's the there's a sort of mindset within uh, this country that you know we're either we either love the Americans because they're big and <laughs> and yeah and that's wonderful amazing brilliant you know I, I love I love Americans amazing and then there's also the thing of like, oh, I hate America because it's big. You know, it's like, <laughs> almost like, it's paradoxical, isn't it? You know, and, yeah, and like, really, yeah. it's like, guys, you know, I, uh, big Sam, old Sam, whatever, you know, it, it, I don't hate you. I, 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 it's nothing to do with that. It's not about that. 
I mean, there's a guy, there's an orange guy that that's, thinks he's driving the wheel, <laughs> but he, he really isn't. Um, you know, he's he he thinks he's 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 the leader. He's really not, and I don't really care about him. I don't really care about his name. Um, but but really, like, hey, old Sam, let's just we need to keep this because this is too important to us. Mm, mm. You know, it's something that we we're very good at. Mm. But hey, you know, we can teach you stuff. Come buy that yeah. off us. You know, yeah. and I think it's you, interesting because we've just started for the first time since Mad Cow Disease started. We've just taken our first load of beef out to America yeah. from a new trade deal. So you know, is politically is that opening up a uh, a gateway for them to do the same over here with some of their products and things, you know, it's mm. not the start of, of this trade deal. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the concern, isn't it? Mm. And I think, you know, if we're going to bring stuff in, let's bring great stuff in. Yeah, we need coffee. Mm. You know, we need, probably we need bananas. Mm -hmm. um, we need, um, you know, cacao beans, you know, avocados. The stuff that we need to bring in, that's fine. Mm. And let's work with those people that grow those and produce those wherever they're from, whether it's South America or Africa or, you know, in Southeast Asia, wherever it is, let's do that in a, an ethical way that looks after the planet and the people, really important. You know, I've got a friend, James Walters, who makes uh, bean-to-bar chocolate and he gets his cacao beans into Stoke-on-Trent. He makes chocolate in Stoke-on-Trent, mm -hmm. you know, in Longton. And, you know, his... Prod product he knows the farmers mm. you know and that's what I'm talking about I'm not I'm not stupid to think that you know we have to grow, try and grow everything here that's not what I'm saying mm. but what we can grow here we should grow and do it well mm. in a really sustainable way and when we bring stuff in that should be as sustainable as possible now any accountant um, would say well Chris that's expensive mm. you know uh, what about, you know, how are you going to feed people? We need cheap food to feed. And I'm like, well, hang on a second. Hold on. Hold it right there because we waste so much already. We grow more than we need. Uh, and for that reason, it's just a natural part of the process then just to go, just brush it away and throw it, throw it away. We're getting better at that. Mm -hmm. there are, you know, we are absolutely getting better at that. There's a guy in Leeds who, um, the junk food chef, who does amazing things. Uh, he intercepts food that's going to to bins and he essentially puts it in the places that it's needed which is amazing mm -hmm. you know if you think about you know food banks do a great thing they you know that's amazing what they do and there's no coincidence that that's gone up and up and up to what's happening in society at the minute you know let's make no mistake about it you know there's those those two things uh for more food banks is a process of the need you know um food banks because of the way they're govern, governed and uh, they have to throw stuff away. They get given fresh food and they, they can't use it, you know? Cor again, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, I don't know everything. Um, but, but, you know, if that's, if that's the case, then that's outrageous. Mm. Um, I think at the point of, of need for people coming in to get food from a food bank, there should be an, hopefully be an opportunity to educate people and what to do with that food, you know, and, and how not to waste it and how you know, they can um, learn more and maybe even grow, you know? I'm not for a second, it, it, it's weird, isn't it? Because we talk about um, agriculture and, and, and the rest and we, we, rightly or wrongly, we need, we do need big growing systems because there's a lot of people who live on this planet. Mm. At the same time, we do need micro growers, we need, you know, specialists mm. and we, uh, down the, the chain from that, we need people having allotments and growing, you know, that that is really important and I think a great area to to develop is is inner city um, gardens and things. You know where we have stuff we can just go and help There's ourselves some great to. Examples of that, isn't there, around the world? Yeah, it's incredible. Not you know, done enough. No, yeah. you know, and yeah, this all it sounds ideal, mm. doesn't it? Mm. I'm talking ideals here, aren't I? It takes work, it takes people yeah, to have vision and, and yeah, of course it put does. Some time into it, yeah. yeah. But that's all it takes. Absolutely. Yeah, on the other hand. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you this now, without, without ideals, we wouldn't have companies like, like you know, no, matter, no matter where you sit on your view of these companies, mm -hmm. um, but like mm. Apple, Tesla, mm. you know, those guys, they, they I, I'm not comparing myself or anyone to them in any way, mm -hmm. but they did start with a vision and an idea of wanting to um, change something. Mm. 
and when you want to change something, you are going to make mistakes. You know, I, I, if you know, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, yeah, it's ideal. You're an idiot. Wonderful. Own it. Own that because I don't care, right? <laughs> and also, you know, um, without a want to fail, there is no education. Mm. You know, currently in the sc- in schools, this is a very massive talking point in education: is that you know, kids need to fail. Um, if we don't fail, we just we're stuck in a cycle, and we're essentially we we sense us as humans. If we've got you know, if, if we're if we're if we think we think we're progressing, we're not apes anymore. You know, we wear clothes, we mm. build stuff, make stuff, sell stuff, we cure people, we do this, we do that, we do you know, we go to the bloody moon. Yet, yeah, you know, we can't feed people. Come on, guys, yeah, yeah. it's not working, is it? Wrong there, isn't there? It's not yeah, working, is it? You know, absolutely, yeah. So, in in Chris's utopia, everything's possible. What what's the ideal, what's the ideal way you spend your days? Um. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like you know, business wise, it's busy. Mm. You know, I'm I uh, like say, you know, do we do we, ultimately we feed people. Um, we do the educational stuff. We do consultancy. Mm-hmm. You know, so we enable people. Um. That takes time and energy, mm-hmm. you know. I now look after myself as much as I can because, um, coming from a place where you know low self-esteem um, and um, um, and medically, what you had when you were ill is still there. You just control uh, it. It's pretty much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I say. I say it's still there. It, it doesn't. Uh, do you know? I think sometimes when you just listen to your body, you, you tune into what your body's telling you. you just you can get over some things, not everything, but some things, you mm-hmm. know? And I think, luckily enough for me, in that case, that, that is the way it is. Um, I, I need, I appreciate now how important it is to look after myself, and that's, mm-hmm. that's what I do. Mm-hmm. Um, and your question was, you know, what, what's the, uti- the other side of it is family, mm-hmm. you know? Nothing more better than just kicking back with the kids, mm-hmm. my wife, and just having a good time. You know, whatever that is. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I'll be honest with you, Pete. You know, lockdown for us, despite the initial kind of, <gasps> this is absolutely, you know, what is going on? You yeah. know, um, ultimately, you know, it was great because we 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 sat together, we ate more together, we um, we explored our neighbourhood more. You know, it was we've had some good times. Good, yeah. really good. You know, yeah. come out of it really think feeling really positive and. You know, uh, sad, I guess sadly that not not the same for everyone. But you know, that's how that's how it was for us. It's been re- it's been really good. So yeah, I mean, I, I love do hear that story quite a bit. You know, yeah, yeah, more yeah. time to summary family, more yeah, time to reflect. Definitely. You know, in that same way that that illness allowed you to reflect on things, mm. it changed everything. You know, mm. it's been forced on people to mm. have that time. Now whether they whether they've taken that positively and used that positively to think about those things, well, that's up to them, isn't it? At yeah. the end of the day, which I hope most yeah. people have. Yeah. To some extent. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, you know, it's been a, it's it's been a, a funny six months, but it's been good. It's mm. been really good. I mean, it's also given me time to grow stuff in the business. Mm. Um, I, uh, to be honest, early lockdown was just you know a lot, lot lost a lot of work, mm. and I just then went online and did cookery sessions for for kids and families, mm. um, which had some incredible views. And you know, um, you know, if you gain from that, you know, it was. It was really good fun and mm. looking to do that again soon. Um, but yeah, you know, for me, it's about striking that balance between what we do with Feasted mm. and and family, mm-hmm. you know. Um, that's what it's all about. Mm. Feast and family. Love it. Great. Yeah. It's good stuff. Yeah. We meet people in moments in time, don't we? We, uh, you know, we, we meet up with people. We might get into a conversation. We know what that person is at that time. But I think it's important to know how that person got to that place that you've met them at and stuff. And I think we've done that a little bit today. I yeah. think we've give, given people lots of names and information to research and look up if they're interested in what you've been talking about. I yeah. think that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. And here's to the future. Amazing. Great to talk to you. Yeah, you too, Pete. Thank, Thank you, you for inviting me in. Cheers. Thank you.